Hey church, in just a moment, we're about to kick off service. Did you know we have an amazing kids ministry? Kids up to 12 years old can be checked into a secure kids classroom where they will receive fun and relevant teaching. This also allows you to focus on worship and God's word in this room. We also want to remind you to silence your cell phones so that we can have a distraction-free environment. So let's press in and worship God together. your purpose in Christ, learn more about us and who we are, and ultimately how you can get connected with us here at Compass North. And with that, let's, let's dive, dive into, into worship. worship. Thank you, Shay and Layla. Sometimes you gotta dance through the darkness, sing through the fire, pray when it don't make sense sometimes you gotta stare down the giant worship from the lion's den sometimes you gotta shout it from the mountain louder in the valley trusting that he's gonna get you there sometimes you gotta welcome the wonder wait for the answer worship with your hands in the air I'll praise you anywhere. Praise, give a praise, give a praise in the highest. Praise, give a praise, give a praise in the highest. He is worthy. Oh, he is worthy of all of our praise. Sometimes you gotta praise in the prison. Cry out to heaven. Shout it till the door swing wide. Sometimes you gotta stand on your shackles. Brave in the battle and worship with your hands held high. I'll praise you anywhere. Praise, give a praise, give a praise in the highest praise. Oh, praise in the highest. He is worthy. Oh, Give him praise, give him praise in the highest praise. Give him praise, give him praise. He is worthy, yes he is. He is worthy of all of our praise. Yes he is, he's worthy of all of our praise. Come on, let's sing this faithful. Faithful all my Blessings day and night, countless reasons why I'll praise you anywhere, every promise kept Goodness every step, each and every breath I'll praise you anywhere, faithful all my life Blessings day and night, countless reasons why I'll praise you anywhere, every promise kept Goodness every step, each and every I'll praise you anywhere. Praise, give him praise, give 
give him praise in the highest praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest He is worthy, yes, he is. He is worthy of all of our praise. Oh, I'll praise you anywhere. In the valley, on the mountain.
All right, church, welcome to Next Gen Sunday. My name is Ryan Lawrence. I'm the student ministry director here today. You know, it's important for us to remember that it's not just us here in a silo worshiping God together today, but there are many churches throughout this community, our state and our nation, the world, who are also worshiping the Lord and trying to serve him and bring light to a dark world. So one of those churches in our community we wanna lift up in prayer today is Grace Church, led by Pastor Jeff Bogue. So we're gonna lift them up in a prayer in just one moment. You know, Psalm 95 says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. I love that passage because no matter what has happened in your past, today, you can hear his voice. Don't put it off till tomorrow. Oh, I'll, I'll do that tomorrow. I'll change things tomorrow. But it can be today you can hear his voice. And so if you feel that God, as we are worshiping together today, as we are praising him, a lot of times when we lift him up, the things that we're so concerned about get into that proper perspective and they get into that proper place. So whether it's fears, anxieties, doubts, things that tingle you up, maybe you need to bring that together to the Lord today. If you need a battle with somebody in prayer, we've got prayer partners on the sides here who are willing and able to help you do that. So I wanna invite all of us to press in. Likewise, there are communion elements in the four corners of our room. And so if you wanna take communion during our worship time, you are free to do so too. So let's gather together in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for Grace Church, for the work that they are already doing. Lord, the enemy wants to tear them down. There are a lot of people who are a part of Grace Church and they do a lot of good in the community. And Lord, so we pray that you would continue to empower them, that you would bring light and bring light to the community around them, that you would lead with Pastor Je uh, Jeff Bogue and that you would help them to reach the lost. For the many who are serving there together today, for the many who are coming in to hear the good news, would you please help them today to carry out your good news? We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Yes, he has. 
we believe that not even the gates of hell can hold back God's plan. Amen. Amen. It's been so good worshiping with you. You may have a seat and turn your attention to the screen behind me. Hey there, Compass Lord Church. Do you know what today is? It's Next Gen Sunday. We want to give a huge shout out to all the youth that are serving on the Dream Team today. If you're new with us, we're so glad to have you here. Church is so much more than just a Sunday service. And we want you to know that there's a perfect place for you, Compass North Church. One of the best ways to connect with us is to fill out the connect card in the service guide you should have received on your way in today. We would love for you to fill it out so that we can get to know you. After the service, take that connect card to the Welcome Center in the lobby and we'll put a small gift in your hands. If you're watching from home for the first time, text CONNECT CNC to 97000 for our digital connect card. And every card turned in, we will donate 20 meals to the Akron Can and Regional Food Bank on your behalf. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7 says, You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. This scripture is so important in showing that giving must be done willingly and with a cheerful heart. Are you interested in learning more about who we are, serving on a team, or even how to join a life group? Then your next step is to go to Path Party. Path Party is behind the scenes of who we are, what we believe, and how to take that next step, whatever that looks like for you. It is every Sunday during the 10 a.m. service in the Dream Team Central Room. We hope you can get connected and do life with us. Yo, David, did you hear? We have some great youth events coming up. You mean the movie night on Saturday, April 20th at 6 p.m., where we're gonna have popcorn nachos and watch everyone's favorite movie? I'll take that as a yes. Now, as much fun as that's gonna be, have you heard about youth camp? Oh yeah, that's a can't miss summer ending highlight. Let's hit the zip lines, worship together all weekend long, July 28th through August 2nd. And stay tuned for more information and signups. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Stay connected with us throughout the week online at compassnorthchurch.com, through the CNC app and on Facebook and Instagram at My Compass North. Lean in and get ready for a great word. We are so glad you're here with us today. All right, all right, all right. What's up, Compass North Church? Come on, how are you feeling today? Everybody feeling good? Welcome to Next Gen Sunday, man. It is so awesome. Thank you, Josh. Seeing all of our students just serving all over the place, up here singing, serving in every area of our church. Can you give it up for all of our students today? So thankful for them and watching God continue to bless and grow their lives. I'm so grateful for our teams that are leading our student ministries and, uh, and, and kids ministries and just watching God do some phenomenal things. On your seat, you heard them mention that on there, but there's that little take home card for you for Elevate Student Ministry. One of the things you need to know, if you have not yet registered your students for camp, you can scan that QR code and get them registered. We need you to do that ASAP if you could. Uh, it is an awesome time. I know I am a, a, a product of youth camps. I would, uh, I'd go there a heathen and come back saved. Come on, somebody. Like, but I did it every year. It was just like the same for a couple of years in a row. It happened every year. But, but uh, to God be the glory. And it made such an indelible uh, impression and impact on my life that uh, we just want to make sure that all the kids, if you, can't, if, if you can't afford to go, we want your kids to go. We will make sure that your kids can be there. Just talk to us. Talk to our youth staff. We'll make sure that we can get your kids there. We want to be a blessing, and I know it's going to be a blessing to your kids. Amen? Amen. All right. Hey, listen, we're in a series called I Declare. Everybody say, I Declare. We are making some declarations about our lives with our lives. And there's a big difference there. There's a lot of people who just talk a good talk, but don't walk a good walk. Can somebody say amen to that? Like, like we don't want to just say things and confess things about God we don't actually live out. We don't just want to make declarations about our lives and, and not actually move in the direction of that declaration. The Bi not the Bible, but our church stands on this one thing, direction matters. And we say this, direction, not intention, determines your destination. You, you can intend to become all kinds of things, but if you don't point your feet in the right direction and start walking that declaration out, then you're never going to get to where you want to get to. You've got to walk it out with your life. And so we are declaring some things about God. Today we're going to talk specifically about, we declare that we are a church for the next generation. 
We are a church that believes in and walks beside and lifts up and encourages and empowers the next generation to become everything that God has called them to be for the glory of his name and for the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can someone say amen to that? We are a church for the next generation. We, we say this, they're not generation next, they're generation now. Their generation now, they're on the scene and God is using them in powerful ways. The goal of kids and student ministry here at Compass World Church is we're not trying to not bore them while they're back there. That's not what we're doing. We're not just trying to not bore them. We are trying to transform them into the next generation of apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers and evangelists for the glory of God. We are equipping and discipling the next generation saying God has big plans for your life. We're not just playing games with them, trying to keep them from getting bored. We're trying to transform them into everything that God wants them to become because that's what it's all about. Here's the reason why. Everything in our future depends on our next generation being transformed by Jesus. Think about this stat. I was reading this. Uh, it said by 2025, watch this next stat. Millennials and, and Gen Z, so there's five generations on the scene right now. There's builders, boomers, and that's a negative term among the Gen Zers. My kids call me a boomer. I'm not a boomer. Let's not go there yet. Stay with that little slide there real quick. Hold on. But, but, uh, there's Gen Xers. And which is what I am, and then there's millennials and Gen Z. But what it's saying is by 2025, next year, millennials and Gen Z will make up 70% of the workforce. Think about that, on your jobs. Within our church, we're developing leaders at the next level that are Gen Z and millennials in government, in industry, in arts and entertainment. They are taking over the world. That's why we say it is important for us to raise up the next generation and let them see Jesus the way they're supposed to see Jesus and carry out their calling on their life because they have the power and potential to take the world by force for the glory of God in Jesus. Jesus name. And we believe it. We believe in the next generation. But here's something staggering. Listen, here's something staggering about the next generation. And, and, and I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer, but the Gen Z generation is the least likely generation to read the Bible or go to the Bible as if it is God's word for their life. They are. But here's something encouraging about that. This stat that I was just showing you here just a second ago, this is saying the rise of spiritual hunger. Gen Z has the highest spiritual hunger of any generation on the scene right now. They want to authentically experience God for themselves, and they want to go to a place where God can be experienced and a church that believes in the power of God in their lives. Come on, somebody. They want to experience God. They want to know him. They want to, they, they're, they're less likely to read the Bible, but they're more likely to engage. And here's what the statistic goes on to say. Which generation is more likely post-pandemic to come back to church? It's not boomers. Come on, boomers. It's not you boomers. It's, it's Gen Z. They're more likely. That's why you have college campuses busting out in revival right now. That's why you got Asbury and all these other Liberty and all these other universities where the spirit of God is moving and they're baptizing the next generation by the thousands because they want a true, authentic experience of God in their life. And how many you know that we have a God who can be experienced? We have a God who's ready to reach into your life and show you his power and just how strong he is. The next generation want to see it. I want to help them see it. Now, listen, I, I know the boomers are, are way down here, way down here, less likely, probably because they're retired and they're like, we can just watch him on TV now with our coffee. But most of them are thinking this, they don't really need us anymore. They, they, don't, they, got the, they got all those fancy lights going now and the music's so loud and they got screens and they got fog machines everywhere. They sing all that new loud worship music that I hate. That's what they're saying. And there's like, there's no room for me anymore. And let me just tell you something. If you're a boomer in this place right now and I'm not using it in a negative way, if you're a boomer in this place right now, we need you now more than we've ever needed you before. This generation needs you to show up and show Jesus in a way that they have never seen before. They need to hear your stories of faithfulness. They need to hear your testimonies of miracles. They need to hear how you got through situations you didn't know you were going to get through, but the grace of God came and picked you up and turned you around and placed your feet on solid ground. We need your strength. We need your wisdom. We need your guidance more than we've ever needed you before. 
Right now, we need it. I love this. Matter of fact, on my tombstone, I want my family to make sure that they inscribe Acts chapter 13. I want to show you this real quick. Acts chapter 13 says this. It says, now when David, and, and this is King David, mind you, which is Israel's greatest king ever. Like it's the star of David. It's the city of David. It's David, David, David. They all love David. And you would think that Acts would put some huge superlatives about how amazing David is. All it says about his life is when David had served what? God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep, which means he died. He died and went on to be with his fathers who had died before him. No huge accolades. The only thing it says that was all important about his life is that he served God's purpose in his own generation. Can I just tell you, let me tell you something. God has a specific purpose for every generation on the scene right now. There's a specific, I don't care how young you are. Did you see, I said the first service, you see a beautiful little Ivy up here. She's about this tall. She's about this big around. And she's up here worshiping God with everything inside of her. And I just want you to know, I don't care how young you are in this room right now. Don't despise your youth. God has a plan for your life. God has something you can do to transform your life and transform the world with your life. Just showing the praises of God in your youth does something powerful to change people's lives. But also, let me tell you, I don't care how mature you are, how many years you've lived. I don't want to say old. That's the word I'm trying to get around right now. I don't care how long you've been on planet earth right now. You may have been around a long time. I mean, you may have known Moses and Noah and <laughs> shook hands with Methuselah. Come on, somebody. Like, <laughs> That's right. Let me tell you something. And you're saying there's nothing left for me to do. You couldn't be more wrong. There is something powerful. You are still here by God's design and by God's purpose. And God wants you to own the purpose for your generation before he takes you on. Death is the final chapter. There's nothing more to do then. But if you're still alive, come on, somebody. God has something special he wants to do through your life. We need your wisdom. We need you to engage this next generation more than ever before. Here's what we mean by being a church of generations. We're not asking 80, 85-year-olds to go serve in kids' ministry, Right? Young people will die if that happens. They're, they're going to get killed. Because you don't have the patience for it anymore. I don't even have the patience for it. Man, I'm just amazed. I, I love our kids' workers and kids. I, it is awesome to see them in there and, and moving with the kids. And it's just like, I would kill half of your kids. Right? And so here's what we're saying. If you're 70, 80 years old, why don't you find somebody who's 50, 60 years old? And why don't you help them as they're moving and transitioning into empty nesting and figuring out the end of their career and what life looks like beyond what they've been doing for the last 30, 40 years of their life? How do you, trans how do you live successfully in the latter years? Why don't you show them what it looks like to be faithful to God and still hold on to your values and still hold on to your virtues in the generation you're living in? Why don't you pour it out to the next generation in your life? And then you're, 40, you're 50 and 60 years old, why don't you grab some 30, 35, 40-year-olds who are, who are engaging in careers and, and they're, they may be pursuing the wrong stuff and you realize, man, I pursued all that with everything inside of me and it burnt me out and it cost me my family and it hurt so much I didn't get any progress. Let me show you how to live godly in your pursuits of things that you want to do for your life. Let me show you how to maintain sanity. Let me show you how to do work-family balance. Let me show you how to make sure that you set yourself up for true success. Then you 30-year-olds, why don't you look pour into some 20-year-olds and show them what it's looked like to come through college and into career and still serving God. And you 20-year-olds, why don't you get involved in, in kids' ministry and youth ministry and pour out to the next generation and raise them up to be godly men and women? Are you with me in the house? Every generation serving the next generation. Watch this. this I love what, I love what uh, 2 Timothy says. 2 Timothy chapter 2 says this. Look at this verse. And you then, this is Paul talking to Timothy, my son. He's not his biological son. He's a spiritual son. And there's something powerful when a church understands their spiritual identity to raise up the next generation. To pour into spiritually in the next generation, he's saying, you, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And watch. And the things, and he's going to list five generations here, five ways to expand yourself. The, the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrusted to reliable people who will also teach others. It's a five-generation span. And can I tell you, there's five generations on the scene right now. There's builders, there's boomers, there's Gen Xers, 
there's millennials, and there's Gen Z. And he's saying, you got to, if you're going to do, if the gospel is going to go forward, if we're going to keep per, pursuing God with everything inside of us, you've got to pour into every generation that's on the scene right now. And you've got to value the next generation. Here's my pursuit today, and that is we are looking for generational transfer. I'm a Gen Xer. Any other Gen Xers in the house out there, Gen Xers? My kids call me a boomer, but they don't really understand. I'm not a boomer. It's, it's, it's such a... It's a, it's a hit right now. I don't even know why. You boomers are, are amazing. I love you boomers. But they'll be like, I'll do something dated or whatever. Like they call me, I walked off stage. My son said, not bad for a boomer, dad. And I said, son, I'm not a boomer. Matter of fact, somebody said I look like a, an older Justin Timberlake when I was in the hallway. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. Right. <laughs> This is youthful as I can look on Next Gen Sunday, right here, this is it. Um, and, and so, so, so they, they, I'm a Gen Xer, and I think it's intentional, at least I feel that call on my life, to be the, the generation that's between generations. I, I feel like I understand the builders and the boomers. I think I get you. I, I think I, I, get, I get the press. The, the, the perseverance of the presence of God and, you, and the new stuff that's happening and I get the transition from old hymns and I get the, I get the, 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 the revival that took place in your generation and, and the way you pursued God. I get it, I understand. I feel like I lived in it enough that I understand it, but I also understand the next generation as well. I feel like I get the millennials and the Gen Zers and, and I feel like it's God saying, I need you to live in the tension. I just feel like there's a, there's a time right now in the earth where we need to pull the generations together for the glory of God. That God is gonna be glorified when we learn to do this thing together in the power and strength and the wisdom of the older generation and the zeal of the younger generation. When we can pull wisdom and zeal together, God is gonna be glorified and great things are gonna begin to happen. Are you with me in the house? But it's not easy. It's, it's challenging. Because some of you older folks look at these younger people and say, they are, they're nuts. They, oh, they fall off their rocker, but you, you got to give a little grace here. Listen, you don't know how much that they have to, have to endure that you didn't have to endure. I mean, all these aren't, they didn't just grow up with cell phones, they grew up with smartphones, Right? And they're getting thousands of messages every day. They're on, they're on system overload. They're, the anxiety is at an all-time high in this generation. Mental health conditions and issues at an all-time high in this generation. These kids grew up seeing terrorism all over the place, right? They, they went through a pandemic and their Generation Z because their Generation Zoom call. Come on, somebody, like, <laughs> their Generation Zoom Right? Pornography, you don't got to search for it. It just blows up in your face all the time. And you're a church that preaches purity and coveting with your eyes and serving the Lord in purity. And you, you have to dodge it all over. You can't even get away from it. And then those that are on the, on the, on the cusp of, you know, they're kind of their 25 or they, they are trying to buy homes now with inflation as high as it is and interest rates that are crazy and student debts that are way over their head and they're just processing so much stuff. Can we just have a little bit of grace for what they might be going through that we don't understand? Right? And, and we, we've got to come to this place where we deal with the tension and this, this is the best I could do right here. This is, I, I said either I'm going to get capped shoulders by the time this is all over with or I'm going to have surgery. Come on, somebody. It's in the tension right here that we, this is where the strength is built. This is where power is formed. This, this is where you start being able to do things you couldn't do before. There, there's no power form when you're like this. Like, I'm sweating doing this. I'm, I'm sweating. This is how out of shape I am right here. There's no, this, is, this is not creating power. That's not creating muscle. That, that's not giving any influence. That's not changing anything right there. It's when you embrace the tension that stuff starts to be formed. And we get a lot of generations, they don't want to embrace the tension, so the older generation just gives up on the younger generation, and churches start dying because they're losing the vibrancy and the relevancy to the next generation. And they're sitting over here trying to pump this and saying, why aren't we growing? Why isn't anything happening? Why is the power of God not here? Because you're not bracing the tension. And then the younger generation doesn't understand authority and they don't like submission and they don't like rules. And so like, get rid of them. And they're over here going, why are we so broken? Why are we so directionless? 
Why do we not understand life at all? Why does everything seem like a mystery? Why does everything seem overwhelming? Why can I not seem to conquer day by day? Because you're not living in the embrace of the tension that God wants us to live in. There's a beauty to build in the tension. Are y'all with me in the house right now? And so we gotta embrace this tension and generational transfer to make sure that we pass it on right to the next generation, living in that transfer. Here's the first two tension pieces. You gotta, you gotta learn the tension between grace and truth. These are the foundations of our gospel. Grace and truth. And there is a tension between the two of them. There is truth, but there is also grace. And here's what I have to say. Shaka, shaka, laka, shaka, laka, shaka, boom, shaka. When I get a mic like this in my hand, I, wanna, I just want to preach like a Pentecostal preacher. I just want to get a Hammond B3 organ and be like, bam, bam, ha. I used to preach that way. I'm going to scare the heck out of half of you. <laughs> it's funny. Living in the tension of the transfer. The gospel is founded on grace and truth. Here's the way I like to say it. Grace wins, but truth is relevant. So so if you're going to ask, when we get into argument about something, here's the deal. Grace wins for us. If we're trying to process some difficult thing, grace wins for us. But truth is still relevant. Here's maybe another way to say it and bring it down a little bit further, and that is this. We lead with grace, but we love with truth. We lead every conversation with grace, but here's the deal. I don't truly love you if I'm not willing to speak truth into your life. You, you, can, you can like gloss things over so much, like, oh yeah, everything's okay, and their lives are falling apart, and you're like, oh no, it's okay, just keep trying, just keep trying. No, sometimes you gotta get confrontational if you love someone. You don't love them if you're not willing to speak truth into their life. It's the love that draws us. So here's the deal. We, we lead by grace, but we love by truth. And we need to live in the tension between grace and truth because it's where the gospel is found. John 1, 14 says this, watch. We have seen the glory, the glory of the only one, the Son of God, Jesus the Christ, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. And every time you see these two words paired, grace always is the first one because grace always leads with Christ. We always lead with grace, and then truth accompanies grace because love is there. So, so, so grace and truth, verse 17 goes on to say, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So what is truth? Listen, God's standard is truth. Well, what is God's standard? God's word is God's standard. And when we have a generation, uh, all five generations will agree that here's the deal. God's word is God's standard and God's truth is God's truth. And we're willing to align our lives with God's truth, not God's truth with our lives. That's where the power happens in our generation. When we're willing to let God's truth be truth. But here's the other thing. The Bible says in John 17, 17, sanctify them by the truth. This is what Jesus is praying. What is truth? Your word is truth. That we got to have a standard by which we bear all things as truth. But then what is grace? Well, grace is that unmerited favor of God that none of us deserve. Right? When you stop losing grace, when you start losing grace for the next generation, you have to remind yourself that God gave your generation just as much grace. Come on, some of you hippies almost ruined everything for everybody. Half the crap we're dealing with right now is your fault. Right? And God gave your generation grace. Don't you think you should let him have the same measure of grace on every generation? And maybe, just maybe, we ought to extend some grace to the next generation that God's still forming their lives and moving their lives forward. Grace is God's unmerited favor. Ephesians chapter 2 says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift of God. Salvation is not a reward for good things that you have done. So none of us can boast about it. None of us can act like we're good enough for God now. It's all God's grace that brings us together. So grace and truth is that tension we have to wrestle with. They're foundational. And here's the reason why. Without truth, we're corrupt. We just do whatever we want to do. There's nothing that holds us to a standard, and we end up bankrupting our lives. We're corrupt without grace or without truth. 
excuse me, without truth, we are corrupt, but without grace, we are condemned. I talked to you last week about that 51% mark. How do you know the good is good enough? You don't. You, have, you need, all of us need the grace of God. So here's the true measure. Listen, truth without grace is mean. You ever been to one of those churches? Those truth-thumping, Bible-thumping churches who want to beat you over the head with everything and show no grace in your life? Truth without grace is mean, but here's the deal. Grace without truth is meaningless. We can't just pat each other on the back and act, sing kumbaya and act like everything's okay. There's a truth that needs to confront us to bring transformation to our lives. No, the balance is grace and truth coupled together is the medicine that brings healing to the wounded soul. It's Jesus coming to this woman. I can't really do this anymore. Ryan, jump up here real quick. I got to hold one hand in. It's, it's, it's the tension that Jesus shows. Please don't let that thing go for fun. I know we love each other. We like to have fun, but please. <laughs> Let's just bring it right here, okay? I better hold it like you're doing it too, case I let go. <laughs> Tell him not to let go. I slap him right in the gut. Uh, it's, it, Jesus shows up on the scene, and there's this tension in the atmosphere because there's a woman who's been caught in adultery. Remember this story? And they come out to her, and I'm the Pharisee, and they're, they're, they're trying to pull real hard on this way. Hey, what are you going to do? We caught her in adultery. The law of Moses says, this is the truth. The law of Moses says we should kill her. And so Jesus is like, you're right, it does. Okay, so here's the deal. You that doesn't have any sin in your life, I want you to throw the first stone. They're like, meh. Right, And then they all start walking away, dropping their stones and start walking away. And then he looks at the woman, and he builds the tension here. And he says, where are your accusers? And she said, they're all gone. The only one who could accuse her is still standing there. The only one who had the right to accuse her is still standing there. And he said, where are your accusers? And she said, they're not here. And watch what he says. Neither do I condemn you. That's grace. But go and sin no more. That's truth. He led with grace, but he still gave truth because you're not healed without truth in your life. Grace and truth marry themselves together, and they have to stay in the tension of being able to say, thank you, Ryan, being able to say, come on, give it up for this man right here. Just amazing. Here's what I'm trying to say. Listen, here's what I'm trying to say. Grace invites us to be free, but it's only truth that can set us free. Grace invites us to be free, but truth sets us free. Here's, the, here's what we wrestle with when we start building on this. Now we have compassion and conviction. We want to generate, raise a generation that's both compassionate but still has conviction. That's understanding but still wants God's authority in their life. You know, we can be loving and accepting without being approving of something every, every, of everything that someone does. You can still be loving and accepting. Here's the way we say it here to the church. We're, not, we're neither affirming nor alienating. We are inviting people to the same table we were invited to, to eat from the only meal that brings healing to their life that Jesus offers to all of us. We just invite people to a table and say, we don't deserve to be here, and you don't deserve to be here, but Jesus invited all of us to be here, so let's come and let's let him serve the meal, and let's let him bring the healing. Let's sit around together and say, look what the Lord can do when we surrender our lives to him. Are you with me in the house? It's both grace and truth. It's both conviction and compassion and when we're building on this conviction, there's five core convictions. I just want to go through these really quickly. There's five core convictions we, we want our next generation to know without, without any reservation. Conviction number one is that you can know God. He's not some transcendent being. He's not some God who's out there who pays no attention. He's not a divine clockmaker that just wound all this up and let it go and wants nothing to do with your life. No, he wants to know you personally. Listen to me, every young man, every young woman in this room right now, God wants a personal relationship with you. He wants to speak to you. He wants to give you visions and dreams. He wants to baptize you with an anointing that's going to change your life and change the world around you. God wants you to know him personally. He wants to speak into your life. And can I tell you, let me tell you something about knowing God. He is far better experienced than he is understood. There was a blind man in the, in the scriptures that Jesus heals this blind man on the Sabbath. And, and so they come to the blind man and said, don't you know how bad this guy is? He's doing stuff he shouldn't be doing. And here's all he says. I don't know if anything you're saying is true about him. Here's all I know. I once was blind, but now I see. 
Because there's a truth beyond truth that's called experience. And when you have experienced God, you have something that even when you don't have understanding, you have an experience to rely on that will get you through stuff you don't understand. We want to teach a generation you can experience God. You can know God personally, and that God has plans for your life. Jeremiah said they're not plans to harm you, but plans to give you hope and a future. He's got hope and a future in store for you. The second thing is that the Bible is God's word. We want to build a generation that understands the Bible is God's word. But listen to me, it's not God's word just because you read it. It's only God's word because it has the power to read you. And when you submit to it, it transforms you out of obedience as you lay your life down, living out what it says for you to do. Here's the reason the Bible has lost its veracity in the generation that is coming up on the scene right now. Because we have a lot of people above the age of 40 who read the Bible, but it hasn't transformed your life. So all you did is read enough to quote scripture that you can judge people by, but it has done nothing to judge your own life and cause transformation to happen to you. So we are declaring something we're not living, and the next generation says, why would I want that? I don't want to be a hypocrite. I don't want to just talk about stuff that doesn't actually do anything in my life. And we don't live in the power of the transforming grace of God that comes from obedience to the scripture, obedience to God's word that reads our lives and makes us change our lives, that produces real power for our lives that the next generation needs to see. You know what first needs to happen? Can I just tell you, every Gen Xer, every boomer, every builder in the room needs to fall in love with God's word again. And you need to let it read your life. And you need to let it change your life. Are you with me in the house? Four people are agreeing. <laughs> Second, the, the, the next thing is you gotta, we want to build trust. You can trust God's ways. You can trust God. He's not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he needs to repent. Let me, hear, let, me, let me tell you what you need to hear. God is good. Even when other stuff falls apart and doesn't work out in your life, God is still good and his thoughts for you are good thoughts. He's not trying to hurt you. He's not trying to harm you. He's not trying to beat you down. He's not trying to throw you away. God is a good God. And listen, he is always loving you. He's always thinking good thoughts about you, and he's always loving you, and he wants to embrace you in his love, and he wants to help you come to an understanding of the power of who he is, that you can trust him. You can trust him with your future. You can trust him with your hopes. You can trust him with your dreams. You can trust him with decisions you have to make when you rely on him. You can trust in the Lord. The next foundational thing is the church. The church needs to become, listen, I will tell you this, families who make the church a priority in their life, raising their kids, they don't let something else take priority. They, they make the church, if you're going to have kids, make them church kids, and they make church a priority in their life, those families see different results. Now, here's what you need to know about the church. We get about 40 to 60 hours a year with your kid. That's not enough. As a parent, you get 3,000 hours. Uh, uh, we get 40 to 60 hours a year. Is that what I said? Or did I say a week? Okay, okay, I, I thought I said a week, and I thought I wanted to backtrack and tell you, do not bring your kids here for 40 to 60 hours a week. They're like, I didn't know we could bring them here 40 hours a week. This is amazing. I'm dumping them off tomorrow at 6 a.m. 40 to 60 hours a year, and you parents get about 3,000 hours a year with your kids. We will never be able to undo what you do not do in your house. Are you hearing me? And the hours we have with them, if all they see is people who, who, who worship God on Sundays and they say, well, there's an altar at church you can go to, but there's no altar in our home. We worship at church, but we don't worship at home. We cannot undo what you don't do in your home. We can partner with you. And let me tell you this, you will never find a better partnership in all your life than when you want to serve God and you want to serve the church and you want to raise your family in the church. There's no, there's no, I love sports teams. I think sports play an intricate role in kids' lives. I love it. But there is no partnership like the church to be able to build the future of your family the way that you want God to build the future when you partner with the local church. There's something powerful about it. And you understand this, it's, the, it's a perfect place for imperfect people. Can I just tell you, if you're, eating, if, if you're eating up the people of God at home and chewing them up and spitting them out, there would be no respect for the people of God in the next generation. 
If you're talking about everything bad that goes on in people's lives, like this is an imperfect place. This is a perfect place for imperfect people, right? And churches that act like they're perfect, they give a wrong cue to the next generation that thinks they got to be perfect, and they know they're not perfect. And they're not willing to live with a mask on. And they want, to, they want to live authentic lives. They want to be vulnerable. And they come into a place where they can't be vulnerable, they will walk away from the church. We want to be a place that says, hey, it's okay to not be okay here. But it's not okay to stay that way because we have a God who can transform your life. And finally, it's ideals. is that God's ways are better than our ways. That God's ways are better than our ways, and we, His ways are best. His ideals for marriage. Can I tell you something? It's hard to teach marriage God's way to a generation when they watch you just shacking up with whoever you want to and making no commitments. Holla at you, boy. I get it. It's hard to preach. It's hard to preach what God deals about sex. When you just sleep with whoever you want to, it's, it's hard to preach modesty to a generation that says to the young women, hey, don't, don't have to, you don't have to centralize yourself and throw yourself away like a piece of meat when all you do is put on these scantily clad clothes and go clubbing and take pictures of yourself booty hopping everywhere. I don't even know what booty hopping is, but it just felt, felt right. <laughs> Here's, here's the deal, listen to me. I know that was stupid. <laughs> but if you left over the stupid things I say, there'd be no church here. I'm going to tell you that right now. That's every Sunday. Here's the deal. This is the, the God's honest truth. 50% of youth will leave the church after high school. That's the standard right now. That's not good enough. I can't live with that. 50% of youth will leave the church after high school. Here you go. Five years ago, look at this statistic. Five years ago, 17% of people between the age of 18 and 30 years old doubted the existence of God. Today, 32%. It's on the increase. And I asked myself, how could that be? Why is it the case? The only thing I can think of is because a generation didn't model for them what it looks like to live in grace and truth. How do I balance this thing I call Christianity with real life. Here, here's what ends up happening, is they hear the stories about God, and they, and they live in this world where everybody only wants to talk about the good things that are happening, and no one wants to talk about the frustrating things that they can't hardly get through, and no one wants to share their own doubts, and all of a sudden, they, they live this Christian life, and then something gets pulled out from under them, and their whole life comes crashing down, and they didn't know how to balance that against another set of rules, another set of realities. They didn't know how to hold the tension together. How did my life fall apart? I can't tell you how many stories I have. I was just thinking through a handful of them, and I'm not going to name any names. And I'm so grateful that our church has been, for a lot of people, a spot where they had been hurt by churches before, and they've, they've found a place of rest here and healing here. And I can't tell you what that means to have a church that people can come to and, and reclaim faith and, uh, and trust in Jesus. But I've heard story after story. There was one guy uh, who was serving the Lord, living a Christian life, looked for a Christian woman, found her. They got married. Things seemed to be going good until they weren't. Then things fall apart, and they get divorced. And he goes back to the church and hoping to find a place where he can feel compassion. But no, instead he gets, can I have those books up real quick? He, he comes back to the church, and, and they say, well, don't you know God's truth? God hates divorce. Don't you, don't you know this? And, and, and they put conviction and condemnation all over his life. And, and they, they say, don't, don't you know what the Bible says? They start quoting scriptures. If you'd have trusted God more with your marriage, this wouldn't have happened. This is not God's ideal for your life. And all they're doing is just pounding him with truth. And he thought, there's no place for me here now. And he leaves the church. Happens over and over again. I had a woman who sent me a link to a, a, a she was just, she was in our church, sad to say. She sent me a link. And show me this picture. I open up the link, and there's this picture of a of a, a gay rally going on. And there's Christians picketing the gay rally, and holding up all these slanderous signs. God hates fags, and all these horrible, horrific things. They're just parading around. And she said, "Joe, I understand the scriptures, but I do not understand this, and I will not be a part of such hate." And she left the church. Come on. Come, what are we showing the next generation? I remember a young lady in our church back in California, her grandma got sick. They've been praying for her grandmother, a good Christian, godly Christian woman. They've been praying for her, and 
And uh, this was in our churches before they came to our church. And, 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 and they, they believed God was going to heal her, and, and he didn't. And she passed away. And so she went to church, and somebody in the church told her, well, if you'd had more faith, your grandmother might still be here. Are you kidding me? They blamed her as if she had some, something wrong with her. She's defective in some kind of way, and she leaves the church. Who knows if she'll ever make it back. A college student who's just trying to figure out life, goes to school, hears all these new things, but he loves Jesus, but he comes back to his, this has happened more than one time, comes back to his youth group and says, hey, I've been processing some stuff. I want to talk about this. And all of a sudden they're like, whoa, science and faith don't mix, bro. They're like, let's lay hands on him, cast this demon out of him. Can't have that here. And then all of a sudden he's trying to figure it out. He keeps coming back to youth group, but everybody keeps distancing themselves from him like he's got the plague. And he just walks away from God. Why? Because the church is unwilling to deal with tensions so that we can make sure the next generation grabs hold of a truth that will stand in their lives. And we got to balance tension. Here's how we do it. i gotta, I got to hurry. But we balance truth. we, we got to balance with mystery over knowledge. We don't know everything there is to know about God. God is, mis- is a mystery. Great is the mystery of godliness. How God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen among angels, preached among men, received up into glory. God, there's some mysteries about God we'll never understand. And if we have to act like we have to know it all in order for following this thing, that's not faith at all. Some of this stuff is just faith. It's just we trust and we believe in God's word. The, the other is life against the Bible. You know, you know, the Bible is true in all that it says, but it doesn't give us every truth about life. So, somehow you just read the Bible and, and if you read enough it will form a biblical worldview for you that you can engage life with but, but you got to understand it doesn't say well what do we do about social media what do we do about gun control what do we do about and all these what do we do about political parties and the Bible doesn't tell us any of these things right and so we start measuring up with life and we don't have an answer from the Bible we don't know what to do with it or we find a reality about life that we agree with but there's somebody in the church that doesn't believe it the same way that we do and we feel like well then I guess I can't be a Christian I don't see that exactly the same way that you do. It's a tension. It's a tension. Another tension is doubt over trust. Can I just tell you, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of doubts in the next generation. And we want to throw them away as if they don't have faith. And they're thinking, I'm just trying to figure this out. But I have some doubts. And can I just tell you something? If you, don't, if you don't have room for doubters in your life, then I can't pastor you. Because I got some doubts too. I got some things I'm wrestling with. Like, God, how could you? And why would you? If you have no room for doubt in your life, this is not the church for you because I cannot pastor you. Here's the deal. Faith's enemy is not doubt. Faith's enemy is certainty. If I have to be certain about everything before I'm going to believe God, then you'll never have faith. Doubt is actually necessary for faith to exist. It's in my doubts that I still choose Jesus to trust with my life. I hope you're getting this. Next is culture. I'm blowing through this so fast. I'm trying to get through this. The next is culture and against the church, and we think that they're against each other. And so, so, so we think that everything in culture is bad. Everything outside of these four walls is bad. I was raised in a church where you couldn't do anything but breathe. That was it. Once you leave these walls, just breathe. Don't talk to anybody. Get away from everybody. Worldly amusements. Just stay away. Don't watch. You can't watch movies. You can't listen to any other music. You got to just get away from it all. And, and, the, and the generation is raising up is like, well, here's my, here's my perspective on culture. There are some things about culture that we can absolutely receive and just enjoy. But there's some things about culture we should absolutely reject. And then there's things about culture we should absolutely redeem and show it the way God actually wanted it to be. But the arts and the industries and the music and all this stuff, like we, we, want, we want people to engage that from a godly perspective and say, there's some things about culture that are beautiful that you can go experience God in. And instead of just cutting it off and saying, no, that's all bad, 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 you're bad if you even like that. Are y'all with me in the house today? I mean, I'm sweating hard enough. Somebody has to hear what I'm saying. Like a pig on a stick. And finally, here's the deal. Here's the, here's, the, here's the last thing I want to say. It's, it's our brokenness amongst our ideals. The ideal is, hey, God has a way that he wants you to live your life, but all of us mess that up. And we break it. And we're broken. And here's what I love about the gospel. 
God uses broken people. It's not about getting it all right. It's not about telling the next generation they can't misstep or they have to do everything just right because that is just too burdensome and you can't even do it yourself. It's about saying, hey, trust God, love God, move with God, but you're going to make mistakes. And here's the beauty about God. He still picks you up, dusts you off, embraces you, and sends you back on your way to try again. God uses broken people. I, I, was, I heard a song a couple of months ago that I just couldn't get out of my spirit, so I came back and I told Pastor John, we have to sing this song. And so I'm going to invite a handful of our young people out on stage right now. This is a small representation of our youth. Here are our students at the church. And they're, they're coming out any second now. That curtain's going to open, and they're going to show their beautiful faces because they're coming. They're coming right now. They're, there they are. There's, there's beautiful little ivy we talked about right there. They're going to sing this song. And most of, most of them are scared to death to be up here. But, but it's a song about when you get church right, when you deal with the tensions, when you learn to let grace lead, but you love with truth as well, when you balance it all out and you still let God receive glory in all things. This is the song that the generations get to sing. I want you to hear it. steeple still attached when all those cars drive by it they don't know what they just passed no fancy sign one service time and the doors always unlocked it's the first place that I saw the hand of God you couldn't tell healing in those walls you couldn't tell me angels didn't walk those halls on a Wednesday night a Sunday morning we didn't have much but Jesus loved it if you want to know why I am the way I am it's a church I grew up in carpet communion in the back and none of us were perfect but we all tried our best the mother's prayer still in the air the ones who've walked away and the only thing that kept us was God's grace you couldn't tell me church isn't alive today but I know that it is so I tell my kids 
guys are amazing. That's it. That's it. <laughs> That's what it's all about. Owning a faith that transforms your life. That's what it's about. It's seeing them get it, want it, love it, and live it with their lives. That's what it's all about. That's why we do what we do. That's why we embrace the tension so they can know Jesus. That's why we live with the gospel message in a closed hand, but the method for how we do it in a wide open hand. And say, we'll do it any way the next generation needs to hear it because they matter to God. They matter to God. If you're in this room today and you'll say, Joe, man, I, I feel like I'm not living God's best for my life. I've either rejected it or I felt rejected by it. Maybe you have a, a story where you, you feel like people have judged you and pushed you away and said God has no place for you. That couldn't be a, a more untrue statement that you could believe about your life. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how long you've done it. I don't care how far you have run. You can't outrun the grace of God. He's reaching for you. And if you're in this place today and say, Joe, I want to embrace the love of God that I feel in this room right now because I feel God's love reaching for people in this place right now. I want to embrace God's grace in my life. I want to receive him. I'm telling you right now, Christ is reaching for every single one of you that are far. He brought you here for a purpose, to say, let me have your hand and let me lead your life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, those united with Christ, they get a fresh start. I love that language, a do-over, a fresh start with God. The old goes away and the new comes rushing in. If you need that new life, if you need that fresh start with God, it's here for you right now. I'm going to pray what I call a fresh start prayer. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads all across this room just to give you that moment where it's just you and God. That's the only reason I'm doing that. Just give that moment, it's you and God. And you're in this place today and say, Joe, I want a fresh start with God. I want to turn my life over to him. I want him to be center of my life. I want him to save me. If that's you, when I count to three, you're just going to raise your hand and say, Joe, that's me. I'm going to pray a prayer. And you're saying, I want to be included in that prayer right now. One, two, three. Just lift your hand all over the room. That's me. That's me. I want the fresh start that God has for my life. There's hands all over the room. God's reaching for you right now because he loves you. He loves you. I want to pray with you right now. Those of you that have your hand raised, I'm going to ask you to pray this out loud with me. And everybody around you is going to join. They're going to pray a prayer of affirmation. What you're praying is a prayer of salvation. As we all cry out to God in this room right now. If your hand's raised, I want you to say this out loud. And everybody else join. Say, Father, I need you to save me, to change me, to make me new. I believe that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die in my place for my sin so I could be saved. Jesus, forgive me of all my sin. Change my life. Make me new. Tell him I surrender. From this day forward, you are Lord of my life and I am chasing after you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, church, give the Lord some praise in the house for new life and fresh starts. 
What a great day in God's house today. Man, I'm so glad that you were here. Listen, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, the first time in a really long time, would you text hand up to 97,000 or stop by our welcome center? Also, if you're a guest, please stop by the welcome center. We got a gift we want to get into your hand. Just say hi to you real quick. Listen, until we come together again, you stay calm and prayerful. Have an amazing week. See you next Sunday.